Hello, and welcome to today's webinar workshop, New Season, New Cancels, Ways to Win Back Turned Customers, brought to you by PMP Magazine and our sponsor of the event, Slingshot. Don't leave your potential customers waiting. Slingshot helps you answer first and fast, 24-7, engaging with inbound leads and winning new sales. Built-in automation, integration, and business intelligence reporting ensure every customer request is responded to with no extra back office work. I'm Mackenzie Shoemaker from North Coast Media, content marketing producer for PMP Magazine, and I'll be the moderator for today's event. Before we get started, I want to let you know that today's webinar will be recorded. You are currently in a listen-only mode that allows you to interact with the speakers and the console. A recording of this webinar will be posted to mypmp.net slash webinars and will also be emailed to you tomorrow. At this time, I'd like to accustom you to the ways that you can participate in today's webinar workshop. Please notice the Q&A panel at the left-hand side of your console. If you have a question or comment, you can type, in, type it in to the panel's text box, then click Submit to send your question to our speakers. We highly encourage you to ask and enter any questions or comments you may have during the presentation to allow for our speakers to interact with you. Questions submitted during registration have already gone to our panelists and may be covered during the presentation. If you experience any technical difficulties during today's event, you may use the same Q&A panel on your screen to submit your issue, and technical support specialist Ellen Wagner will personally assist you. You can learn more about our speakers by viewing their photo, bio, and email address in the panel located on the right-hand side of your console. If you are logged into your social media accounts, you can share the webinar's title, description, and URL with your friends or colleagues using the Share This widget you'll see in the bottom left corner of your screen. The Resources panel houses a PDF of today's presentation as well as Slingshot's website and PMPs. You can also use a contest Contact Us widget you see on the bottom left-hand corner to reach out directly to myself or to any of our speakers. Along the bottom of the screen, you will see the Reactions button housed in the Control Panel. Feel free to use this throughout the webinar to allow for all participants to see your reactions. Now I'd like to introduce today's speakers. Today we will be hearing from Will Haynes, Vice President of Marketing for Modern Pest Services. Will joined Modern Pest Services in 2017 as the Vice President of Marketing. As a part of Antistemic, Modern Pest Services has seen tremendous growth throughout New England since 2017, including 11 new acquisitions. Will has over 24 years of experience in strategic marketing operations in a variety of industries, including retail, automotive, and industrial products. We will also be hearing from Haley Damron, Social Media Coordinator for American Pest. Haley joined American Pest in 2016 after her move from Kentucky and started as Social Media Coordinator. American Pest has grown through Maryland, D.C., and Virginia through 16 acquisitions, providing many different opportunities and allowing her to advance into the Director of Marketing role as of March 2021. And lastly, we will be hearing from Chad Hall, Vice President of Brand Marketing, Brand and Marketing with Wayne's Pest Control. Chad joined the Wayne's team in 2019 as Vice President of Brand and Marketing shortly after the company was acquired. During that time, the company has doubled in revenue through strong organic growth and aggressive M&A. At this time, I'll turn the presentation over to Will. Will, take it away. Thanks, Mackenzie, Mackenzie and thanks for the introductions of uh, myself, Haley, and Chad. Um, to everyone, thank you for taking some time to talk about a subject that I think is near and dear to all of our hearts um, when it comes to, you know, the, the ability to retain a client and the ability to win them back when a client does leave our business. Um, I hope everyone is at the time of year where you're starting to enjoy some warmer weather. I'm based here in uh, just outside of Portland, Maine, and I, every day I feel like I wake up and I hope it's going to get warmer and warmer, but it doesn't seem to be happening quite yet. But we do know that our busy season is, is near and if not uh, going to pop any day now. And with that comes, you know, the opportunity to really understand 
what's happening in our business when it comes to retention and the way to win back a client if they do leave. As Mackenzie uh, stated, she gave a great introduction of who I am. Um, I've been with Modern since 2017. I was uh, recruited to this position as, as Modern joined Antisemex. And I, I love to tell the story of, of the call that I had with the recruiter when I first learned about uh, the position, and I kind of groaned when I heard the word pest control. Um, having no experience in the industry, I just didn't know what it was all about. And as I learned about uh, modern and then Antisemex in the U.S. and the opportunity to join an organization like Antisemex, I was extremely excited, you know, about the prospects. And I've been here for now five years, and I don't see myself going anywhere else in my career. Um, as many of you know, Antisemex entered into the U.S. market in 2017, and our growth has been extremely exciting. Um, the model of Antisemex in the U.S. is and throughout the world is is different than you see from a lot of companies and that it's decentralized. So you see a lot of logos here on this screen, and it really mimics to who we are as an organization, where we have individual platforms working together and collaborating, but really understanding each individual market separately and really being an expert in our own market. What's really exciting for folks like myself is I have colleagues in other areas of the country who do something similar very, uh, very much like I do every day. So. When I got the opportunity to do this presentation, I immediately reached out to Haley and to Chad and really thought, you know, these, these are folks who are doing something similar to what we do up here in New England with Modern, but also are doing different things and unique and have a unique perspective on both retention and win back campaigns. Uh, one thing that I didn't get in my introduction is I'm also a professor of business. I've been teaching uh, both business, marketing, and financial management here in Maine at a community college, and I've moved over to the University of Maine this year. And I love being part of, you know, the fact-finding and the mission-finding when it comes to uh, what we're talking about in these virtual sessions. So I always like to start with some sort of a poll to really get a pulse of, of the room, or in this case, the virtual room. So here are some questions, and I'm going to pull up the first question. I'll, I'll give a little overview of what we're doing here just to get an idea of where we're at and get a level set when it comes to retention and win back campaigns. Uh, you as an attendee will be able to click, as I pull up these questions, we'll be able to click on uh, your selection for each individual, individual poll question, and then we'll be able to share the results uh, with you in real time. This is completely anonymous, so please be as honest as you can and uh, we'll have some exciting stuff on how to steer the conversation. So question number one is what is your current client retention? And be honest, and if you don't know, you, you don't know. So I'm gonna go ahead and give everyone about uh, 15 or 20 seconds to fill this out. We have a few more selections coming in, and then we'll we'll jump forward. All right, let's see what we got for the first one here. Actually, we got a couple more coming in, so I'll hold off like five more seconds. Awesome. So as you can see, and Chad is going to be speaking to this. Uh, in just a few moments, but we have a pretty wide range of what client retention is at our individual businesses. Um, even here within Antisemex individual platforms, that number is wide ranging as well. And then between branches, which is each geographic territory within, at least for modern, uh, the retention also varies very widely. Really interesting to see that people, you know, are all over, all over the place, which is pretty common. And we'll talk more to that in just a moment. All right, question number two. Do you think you can make a significant improvement to retention with the change in your customer experience strategy? So do you think that you have the ability to really move the needle when it comes to customer retention if you really laid out a customer experience strategy that's defined? 
go ahead and submit one there or answer that question and we'll take a look at those as well. All right, I think I know what this one's gonna be, but we're gonna go ahead and click ahead. Awesome. So yeah, this is definitely something we're gonna be discussing here today is, is the ability to make a customer experience strategy work for your business. Um, we hope, you know, this is a, is a presentation. It's always hard in a virtual setting, but we've really set this up in a way to make this as much of a workshop as possible so everyone who's attending today can walk away with the ability to start a customer experience strategy. All right, question number three. Do you have a pre-cancel save process when a client is ready to cancel? So the client is calling in, emailing in, they're ready to cancel for whatever reason, and we're gonna talk about that today. Do you have a process in place as of today on what happens when that client calls in to, to cancel? Go ahead and do those answers again, and we'll take a look at that. And I think you're gonna be very surprised. All right. Awesome. That was just what I was expecting to say. Some of us have a really well-defined pre-save process or a yeah, save process when it comes to cancellations. Some of us don't, and that's okay. You know, that's definitely part of the journey on how we can explore, and we hope to start that process for you again today. And uh, for those who aren't sure, you know, it's a great opportunity to, to ask questions and really find, you know, through your organization if you do have that. All right, a couple more. This is this is fabulous. So thank you for participating. A couple more that we're going to go through here that really will help set the benchmark. When a client leaves, do you know why they left your company? And you, can you provide data to build a win, cap, win back campaign? So this means client calls in, they go through the process, they leave. Do we know why they left? And do we have the ability to take some sort of data from their uh, cancellation and do something with it when it comes to win back. So again, go ahead, see what uh, what we got here from the group. I think it's going to be pretty similar to the other question where it's a mixed bag, but let's take a look. All right, awesome. So yeah, just as we expected. We do have some good data of why we leave or why a client leaves. You know, did they leave because they sold their house? Did they leave because the price was too high or whatever it may be? But uh, we can now set, have a level set on how we might be able to win that client back. So for those who answered yes, great, you're already on your way. For those who are unsure, they haven't. Um, this, is, this is a great opportunity to learn about how some of the other folks on this call have been doing it. All right, be honest here. Have you ever completed a win back campaign in the past? And you're gonna see a few slides ahead. I'm gonna raise my hand as someone who, at least here with Modern Pest, hasn't fully dedicated themselves to win back campaigns. And I'm gonna tell you why, but go ahead and submit if, if you've done this for your organization in the past. All right, let's see what we got here. Awesome. Yeah, great, great, great uh, level set of where we are. I got to, like I said, I'm right at that uh, group of no, uh, where we really haven't fully defined our win back campaigns and we're just really launching them uh, this month. So that's great to see from the group. All right, two more questions and then we'll get rid of these homework assignments and move on in the presentation. Um, really interesting one, and we're going to talk about this. If, if you've done a win back campaign, what method have you used? Email, phone, direct mail, other? And we're gonna be able to provide some guidance at least to uh, help you define if one's better than another. Go ahead and answer that one. And you can, I should say, you can check all that apply too if you've done more than one.
Awesome. Yeah. So again, this is this is a great set. Obviously, um, you know, the size of your organization can adjust what type of uh, method you're going to use. All of these, there's no wrong answer here, but all of these are opportunities to win back clients. Um, some have different uh, costs associated with them, but really interesting to see. All right. Like I said, a couple more questions. I think I got uh, one more. Do you know the ROI of your win back campaigns? Um, you know, and it, be honest here. If you were to make 100 phone calls to cancel clients, would you know how many of those you won back? Same thing with, with email. If you do an email campaign, do you know what, what percentage of those clients are actually an opportunity to sell something again? Uh, again, I'll give 20 seconds, maybe. Awesome. Yep. Everyone who answered no, you're, you're, you're kind of right with me. Uh, for those who answered yes, great, great job by you. You've really done a, an awesome job to measure ROI. Um, no and not sure. This is, this, is, <laughs> this is the conversation for you. Um, I think we're all in the same boat on how to really measure true ROI when it comes to WinBack. So thanks to everyone for that participation. Um, if you have comments, related to those questions obviously we're going to share those with the group after so you can measure yourself up against the rest of the organizations um, on this call uh, after but um, you know feel free to jump anything in a, in a uh, chat box and we can talk about it during the Q&A session while everybody's doing that I would love to hear from those that entered other um, on the slide about what kind of campaigns you have attempted. Um, if you could use this slide as an opportunity to describe what those other um, campaign opportunities included, that would be wonderful. All righty. I'm going to go ahead and get started here. Um, this is Haley from American Pest. i um, been here about five years and I'm really excited about this today. Um, one thing I want to start with is that there is no magic solution to this camp to a win back campaign in general. Um, Will, Chad, and I have all said as we were preparing for today that we by no means consider ourselves experts when it comes to this. Um, however, it's something that we are all working very diligently on, um, and we want to share our ideas, things that we've been looking into, and also want to hear from you guys and what kind of things you guys are also doing. So, obviously, as you have seen by the poll questions we just did, we do want this to be very engaging, um, and we're excited to see and hear what all you guys have to say. Um, with that said, um, we wanted to then go into um, what the clients are leaving for or why they're leaving. I, you guys said earlier, um, most of us, it appears, does do have an idea of what kind of reasons those entail. Um, here at American, we actually just uh, revamped our cancel reasons that we use when recording those um, phone calls and such. And it's very interesting, but I'm sure as many of you are experiencing, it's probably similar to us where it's just they aren't pleased or satisfied with the service that was provided in general, or they're worried that the price is too high, or maybe a competitor has provided a lower price. Um, just the customer experience overall, um, that's also one that we get, um, I think we often forget about. Um, when it comes to the customer experience, when it comes to booking, scheduling another service, their service itself, paying their bills, all of those things in general, all combined to that customer experience that we need to take into consideration. Um, just with that in mind specifically, um, when we revamped our cancel reasons here uh, about a month ago, we actually broke it out to service experience and the experience when speaking to our customer service team on the phone, anything along those lines, just so that we can, again, get a little bit better idea as to what the real problem is. Um, customer loyalty, what time of year or how long do customers normally stay on, 
Do they have somebody else that they are a little more loyal to that they're raising, leaving for? Um, no need. That's definitely one I'm sure you guys hear a lot of the time. Um, it's one of those that is it that the problem took care of itself? Did all of the work that we have put into play actually make it to or get them to the point that they no longer felt the need to continue service, whatever that may be? Um, and then I know something that we've discussed a lot across the anti CMX platforms is moving and selling homes uh, is something that we always get a lot of um, cancellation for. Um, we've done various things to try to verify that that is, in fact, a real reason. Um, and it's, it's just been interesting over the years to see that that has been the case. And, in fact, it's still a very high uh, percentage of the, our cancels to this day are still relevant to uh, customers moving. So it's just one of those things that we wanted to bring up. Um, if you guys feel that there are any other um, extremely common cancellation reasons that maybe we didn't mention here, please do share. We'd be very interested to hear what you guys have to say. Um, and we'll go ahead and go from there. Um, Chad, I believe you're taking this next slide. Yeah, I've got it. So good, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, I guess, depending on where you're where you're located i'm in the central time zone so i'm just uh, just past noon here but uh here's what we want to say hey what do we know um we know we have to be very honest with ourselves um we were very fortunate as an industry there were a lot of industries that just got decimated when COVID hit and there were other industries that that flourished in in certain parts so for example our industry we we saw all ships rise for the most part on the residential side of the pest control industry. The commercial side of the business, if you were a operator, a provider that was focused heavily on the commercial side, there were major challenges there. So we have some of those in, uh, in, in within our platform companies. At Wayne's, we're heavily weighted towards residential. We're continuing to grow our commercial business, but we were, we were very fortunate when, we, when COVID hit. Everybody was at home. For the most part, everybody was still employed and everybody was sitting on their back porch with their laptops looking out at their grass. We do lawn care as well. We do we do fertilization and weed control, and they were seeing the issues in their home. So everyone was investing. That's why home services, do-it-yourself, DIY, the Home Depots, and the Lowe's of the world really flourished during that time as well. Uh, we had to pivot. We did some things with our commercial business where we were focused on disinfection services, and we did things that we had never done before as platform companies. And and some some provider or some of our platform companies saw a lot more success than others did in, in those sides. But now we're in 2022. We continued to draft a little bit in 2021, and we've got to keep that momentum going. And we're doing that in the face of some of the most significant inflationary pressures that we've seen in, in what, four decades. So uh, our new customer acquisition costs are rising, right? And you can see here five times more, it costs five times more to acquire a new customer than to uh, than, than an, an existing customer. So we're not one-stop shops, you're not either. Uh, I would imagine many of you, if you think about it, you offer multiple services. So you've got maybe termite, you offer pests, you offer mosquito services. In, in our case, we offer fertilization and weed control. Maybe you do wildlife, fire ant, carpenter bee. You've got all these other services that you provide. And so are we effectively cross-selling to our current customers, giving them the right offer at the right time to, uh, to, to possibly take some of those dollars that we would be trying to spend on, on a new acquisition? And certainly if we're not protecting the back door and we're seeing customers leave, we're in big, big trouble, right? Because we're pulling customers in and we're spending all this money to do that. And then we're, uh, and then we're watching them walk out the back door and we're really, really hurting ourselves in the process. And so uh, when we look at these retention benchmarks and we kind of, you know, we looked at our data and I thought the 36.4% of you that said, I don't know what my retention percentage is. Maybe you don't calculate it or maybe you just don't know I think we've got to be very real with ourselves that we have to let data drive our decisions and, and, and drive some of our efforts. So, you know, there's a quote as marketers that was attributed to a guy named John 
uh, Wanamaker. He was a retail magnet back in the back in the day, and he said half of my marketing dollars are wasted. I just don't know which half. And as marketers, we don't have that option anymore. We we have to let the analytics drive our decisions, and we have a lot more data that can say. I see the return on this investment that we're making, and we've got to do that in all areas of our business. Uh, and you can judge yourself against some of these numbers. I can tell you right now as Wayne's, we're missing the mark on some of these benchmarks, and some we're, we're performing well. And these are just general industry, uh, you know, industry opportunities that we need to look at and say, how's everybody else doing, and, uh, and, and how do we perform against that? So now I want to talk about the impact of retention, right? And so th this is really the whole purpose of what we're talking about, uh, the nature of our conversation. And uh, it's just to reinforce retention and customer experience. And, and I'm, I'm, I saw the stats of, do you think that customer experience and improvement in customer experience would improve your retention percentage? Well, Will's gonna give a case study here on the next slide. I'll hand it back over to him. But this first point here, a 2% increase in customer retention has the same effect as decreasing cost by 20%. He's going to walk you through a hypothetical situation that will kind of show you the impact of what it, what it does, right? Because these are the things that we need to be thinking about. That's why you're all here today. And that's why, that's why me, Will, and Haley, are, we're, we're still trying to figure it out, too. We're all in this together. So you see companies that prioritize the customer experience generate 60% greater profits than their competitors. It has a major impact on the experience. And let me give you a couple of examples. So as, as anti CMEX platform companies, one thing that we, that we do uh, pretty regularly, and we've done it for the last couple of years, is all of us as platform marketing leaders, we, do, we participate in focus groups that – I can speak to, I've only been at Wayne's for two and a half years, uh, similar to Will, I came as a result of the acquisition with Annie CMEX from outside the industry. So, um, and, and Wayne's wasn't doing any focus groups prior to the Annie CMEX acquisition. And it's one thing that's really made us better as platform leaders because we're, we're asking our customers, we're getting very clear data from them. As I go back, we need to let data drive these decisions. And so one of the questions that we ask our customers in these focus groups is we say, name the very best customer experience company that you do business with, not, not in whatever industry. And there are two names that always rise to the top. One's Chick-fil-A, and, and now, again, I'm in Alabama, Tennessee, and Mississippi. That's where we, we, we live. But I think that's probably a pretty – broad statement that a lot of Chick-fil-A's all over the country and a lot of people have a very similar experience with them and Amazon, right? We all know Amazon. And so when you think about, I'm going to use Amazon as, as an example, when Amazon continued to improve their customer experience, one is now it shows up immediately, right? Within two days, if you're prime, maybe even faster sometimes, it shows up on your front door. You can pr pretty much buy anything you want. And then they said, okay, let's do this. Let's not have somebody move something to their cart. Let's have them buy it right now. Like when you're looking at an item, you can buy it right then without even moving it to your cart. It's amazing what that has done to they, – they've got it figured out, right? So if we can continue to improve our customer experience, how are we serving our customers? Are we giving them the very best experience that we can because – killing bugs and growing grass and, 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 and protecting against termites and all those things that we do, that's table stakes. If we can't do that, then we're literally just, we're, we're wasting our time. So we have to focus on the customer experience. 80% um, of future profits will come from 20% of existing customers. And that is just building, when you talk about loyal customers and you talk about extending, again, this goes back to, when we provide a great customer experience to our customers, when they, when they are, are, are basically very happy to do business with us and satisfied, when customer satisfaction is high through the experience that we're giving them, they're going to be more willing to give us more of their dollars to spend, right? And so it's very expensive for us to market outside of our customers. Are we effectively marketing and are we effectively uh, targeting the customers that we currently have. At Wayne's, we've got 145,000 customers. I spend a lot of time, as do the other marketing leaders, focusing on our customer 
experience and, and our and marketing to our current customers because it's 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 a lot I have a lot higher success rate and I've got a lot lower acquisition costs when I'm marketing to our current customer base. And then the last the last uh, point here, 34 percent of clients may consider leaving after one negative experience. The moment that we all forget that we're replaceable, we're in big trouble. Uh, and so there are in our markets that we serve, we were in most all different cities across the states that we serve. There are what a dozen in each one of those locations or half a dozen to a dozen, depending on if it's a metro area, if it's Nashville, Birmingham, or if it's one of the more uh, you know, the smaller cities, but there are so many options for our customers to go give somebody else their business to to take care of their issues. And so consumers are becoming less loyal because there are greater, there, there's more opportunities for them to take their dollars and spend them somewhere else. And so are we, uh, are we protecting against that through the experience that we have? And I'm going to talk about this in a, and I'm going to give it back to Will. And then in a couple of slides, I'm specifically going to talk about what are we doing? Because we're not going to be perfect. What are we doing when a, a customer has a negative experience with us? Because it's going to happen. Do we know about it? How do we address it? And and what does that look like? And I've got some very specific data uh, from from our company that I'll talk through, and um, and we'll we'll talk about that here in a couple of slides. So, Will, I'm gonna I'm gonna hand it back to you. Thanks, Chad. So, I, I'm a marketer by heart. And I love to spend my time looking at analytics data and creating what I call, you know, the perfect marketing campaign and strategy. The reality is we also are business people, right? And we also need to make sure that what we're doing makes sense within the business. You know, the, the best marketers in the world, if they created the best campaign and created endless leads, that would only be the start of the 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 funnel and the strategy of, of how to actually turn it into a successful business, right? If you don't have the the labor to support it, if you don't have the proper sales process, if you don't have the proper customer service, all of those pieces would fall apart behind what is maybe the greatest marketing campaign ever. So, you know, and this is this is what we look at here in Antisemex and our platforms, and we're continuously analyzing all aspects of the business and really work together as a leadership team even here at Modern and then across platforms to really determine do we have the business set up the way we want it to be. And, you know, my goal is obviously organic growth. And I think that's one of the things that all of us on this call are hoping to achieve, and that's growing our businesses organically in the areas we operate by adding additional customers, more revenue, all that good stuff. And when we sit down to do our budget process and really define what what is our goal, we usually set some sort of, you know, it could be arbitrary, but it also could be strategic saying, hey, I want to grow the business 10% this year, organic growth of 10%. Great goal, right? Everyone would be pretty happy if we could have double digit organic growth. And then you really got to understand what does that mean? Um, if, you know, and I, I built a, a fake company here. It's not, not my side hustle, Wild Willie's Pest Control. But, you know, if I was a, a leader of a business and I was setting up my business plan for the next year, and I wanted to achieve 10% organic growth, I obviously want to look like what it might mean in new sales, right? So if I'm a $5 million company, my average sales value is a thousand bucks, I need to add 5,000 new clients, 500,000 in new sales. Piece of cake, right? Um, like Chad was saying, the last couple of years in the pest control in industry, especially residential, we've, we've been very lucky. And we seem to have been able to really win clients as they were home for the last couple of years. They interacted with pests more, and we saw that top-line growth, which was great to see. However, that's really only a piece of the puzzle. For those who, you know, don't know what retention their retention rate is or, you know, we don't have a full understanding, we have to all realize that as much as we're filling up the bucket with new sales, clients are falling out of the bottom of the bucket. Some for great reason, you know, we have clients because we just did awesome service and they decided that there was no need. Well, it does happen, but it is a cancellation and we're losing that revenue. Uh, clients cancel because they sell their home. It, you know, no one's, no one's at fault, but the market's hot. But again, that's a client who canceled. So you really need to analyze what that means to in, in your business plan. So like I said, if, if I was the, the, the head honcho at Wild Willys and I wanted 10% growth, 
I really would need to understand what that retention rate is and how much is falling out of the bottom of the bucket to really make sure that I'm achieving my growth. So even if I had an 85% retention rate and some of you during the poll question said you were that high, awesome. Um, you know, if we had a benchmark of 85%, that still means that we're going to lose 750 clients in a year. So even by doing awesome service, providing value, we know we're still going to lose clients. What that means is then in order, we have to replace what's fallen out of the bucket in addition to what we're going to grow for new clients to hit our growth goal. So just for this little tiny $5 million pest control business, in order for us to make up the $750,000 in lost revenue, even with a really good retention rate, and to hit our organic growth goal of 10%, we actually need not 10% in new sales, but 25%. So that's really important to stop, stop and think about too. And this is where, you know, in, in your organization, you want to collaborate with, you know, you, your leadership folks, your finance folks, your executive manager and operations, you know, whoever it may be, and really get an understanding of, is that goal achievable within your business? And just think about it. And, and you know, modern is a great example. We had tremendous growth in new sales in the last couple of years due to COVID, but we also had a tremendous amount of labor issues, just finding enough uh, technicians to support the growth in the business was hard. And even though the sales kept rolling in, were we able to service those clients? Uh, were we able to service our current clients in the way that we wanted to, to make sure that they had an awesome customer experience and they wouldn't cancel? So think about it. Um, here, here's what we do now. A former client, and, and I, actually I should, I should go back one step. What's important within your measurement in, in, uh, of retention is don't let yourself, you know, hit a number and just say that that's our number. It's going to ebb and flow, right? Seasonality of business we all know is going to cause an ebb and flow in retention. But here's what we do know. That client, if they do leave, is going to be easier to win back than a, than a brand new client. Um, we here in Anthocemex talk so much about what's the cost per lead or what's the cost per sale. How do we achieve that new client and, and win that new client? But we know that it's going to be that we're going to have loss due to retention. And we know that that client is actually easier to win back than it is to get a brand new client. The industry says it's about one to three times easier and one, to one third of the cost to win back a client who just recently canceled. So that client who left because they sold their home, are we really truly marketing to them because they probably bought something else? Or if a client leaves because they have no need, are they really are we really confident that they're never going to have a pest issue ever again? And we know we can win these clients back. So that's really the, the focus of the second half of this conversation is how do we win them back? Thanks, Will. And so what, one thing I want to talk about here, and this is a Wayne's case study, so this is data straight straight from us, is the importance of, of customer NPS scores. And for those, I don't want to I don't want to assume everybody knows what NPS is, uh, but NPS stands for Net Promoter Score, and many of you are probably well familiar with this, and some maybe not. Um, but but what Net Promoter Score is is when you have an experience with a provider or you know a service provider or a any kind of company and you get a uh, and you get a survey for example this is exactly what we send out for our pest service hi matt thanks for choosing wayne's birmingham then it's by location your business is highly valued and appreciated quick question on a scale of zero to ten how was your recent enviro pest experience zero four ten excellent what happens is when they give us that score that's sent via text uh, we we started doing that in May of 2020. We had never done this as a company before, and Wayne's is nearly 50 years old. We'll celebrate our 50th uh, anniversary next year, in fact. And so had never done it up until May of 2020. Between May of 2020 and I just ran this data for the end of the month, uh, March of this year, we had sent out 145,000 surveys over that time. And so of that, we had gotten just under 28,000 total responses. And so of those 28,000 responses, people either gave us zero to 10, somewhere in between. And what NPS does is it takes your percentage of promoters 
Subtract, and subtract out of that your percentage of detractors. A promoter is someone who gives you a nine or 10. A detractor is someone who gives you a zero through six. And then the passives are basically thrown out. So as I mentioned a couple of slides ago, I, I told you we're, we're always, as providers, we're going to have a time where we do not serve our customers in the world-class manner that we're all trying to serve them. It could be something that we did. It could be some, it could be a perception of how they received the service that we did or anything. The reality is, is they did not have a great experience. And so what are we going to do in that situation? So during that time, we had 802 of the 27,892, 2.9%. So just under 3% of our, of our numbers came back, hey, zero to six, you did not serve me well. And here's what we've done within our company walls, and it has been a game changer for us, is um, we have literally, when that comes back, all of our, uh, our leaders at our local level, uh, level, our general managers, we call them service center leaders, and our supervisors are all keyed into the, the, to our system and they are literally seeing those responses come back, they immediately take action. So if someone sends us a zero to six, we make contact with that customer within a matter of an of, uh, hour or two, maybe, and it's immediate. And so we want to find out what did we do, uh, how, can we, how can we make this right? And so what we've done in that time is we've taken – because here's what's going to happen. You've got some that are going to want to be vocal. They're going to go out and they're going to go out on Google or Facebook. And there are just some people who are wired to, to be public with their uh, bad experience. There are a lot, and, and I think many on this call, myself included, who are just not that, we're not wired that way. What we will do is we'll just give our business to somebody else. So what this allowed us to do is find out that these people, these 802 uh, customers, they weren't going to go out and blast us publicly, but what they were going to do is maybe within three months or possibly six months, they were going to go find somebody else to do business with. They were going to cancel us, and they were going to go somewhere else. And so what we what I, we've called this the win back before the cancel is finding out, again, letting data help drive. And I see a question here, are we sending this out uh, each service or per annum? So literally, we send this out. We have We have buffers in place. So we're not, we're, we're not going to wear a customer out. It goes out by service uh, with 90-day buffers in between, so per service. So if, if someone had a pest service today, I'm just using an example, and they had a mosquito service next week, they would get one for each because it's service-focused, but within 90 days of each of those, they would not get another, if that makes sense. And so, again, the benefits being, one, just understanding, but long-term retention improvement. We're going to track this. We're going to continue to be tracking this because I believe that these zero to sixes, what we've done, because in some of our focus groups, one of the focus groups that we did, I specifically had nothing but detractors in that focus group because I wanted to hear where do they stand now, and the feedback was incredibly positive that you guys addressed my issue. I'm a huge fan. And they didn't say I was going to cancel you, but we obviously know that's exactly where it was headed. And it would have been a silent cancel and we would have lost them and we would have never realized that we had the opportunity to prevent that from happening. So um, what would you say the average NPS score is across the industry? That's a – NPS scores are – they they vary widely. So I, I do not have an industry benchmark, but I can tell you that – when you see when you see NPS scores that anything over, I mean, if you're in the 70 range, you're considered that, that there are a lot of a lot of data would would say that's world class uh, is, is 70 or above in your NPS score because for for those that understand it, the scale is not zero to 100. The way the math works is it's negative 100 to pause to, to 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 plus 100. So, for example, the way the map works, if every single one of those 27,892 responses gave us an 8, our score would have been 0. Uh, that's just the way the math works. So, uh, so when you see NPS scores and you can, you know, you can see a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of industries live in the single digits. A lot of them are sub, you know, 25 or 30. And a lot of uh, 50 and above is considered, uh, you know, really good, and 70 and above is considered world class. So, I hope that I hope that helps. 
and I'm going to pass it is to, back to Will or Haley? Haley. Okay. Haley. Um, yeah. So uh, I totally agree, first of all, with everything that Chad was just saying about NPS. It's definitely something that is extremely important to everyone um, here in the Antisemex, amongst the Antisemex platforms, I should say. Um, it's something that everybody's had a renewed focus on specifically this year, and Chad is definitely um, a leader of that. Um, so totally agree with everything that he said. Um, now we're going to get into the root of actually winning customers back. Um, so we've lost the customer. How are we going to get them back? Um, and actually this slide is specifically going to be relevant more to the uh, email method, I would say. Um, but we will get into and talk about some of the other things as well here shortly. Um, will found this and shared, and I, I thought it was a great opportunity to review um, five elements that we think are critical to a successful win back campaign. Um, and we wanted to share these with you guys, and then we're actually going to ask in a question if you agree. Um, so the timing of your campaign, um, something that we just started um, here this past month, actually, um, at American is a email that actually goes out the day of the cancellation. Um, I think Will, if I remember correctly, as we were preparing theirs, is um, at the end of the month of each month, um, things along those lines. That timing is still critical. Obviously, it's important to be timely. Um, the sub a catchy subject line, specifically. Um, as we, us three, are all marketers, um, subject lines are always very important to us. Um, it has a impact on open rates and anything along those lines, um, how likely you are to click it, how likely it is to end, get caught by spam filters, things along those lines. Um, a recognizable from line. This is something that I think is probably one of the more critical things that's often forgotten um, when it comes to an email like this. Um, you don't necessarily want to receive an email, for example, from cancellations at retention.com you want to see that come from somebody that you actually know and are used to seeing that email address, know who it is, know why they're reaching out, and go from there. A short and meaningful conversation. We, of course, would love to talk on the phone and get, do everything that we can to get a customer back, but in all reality, that's going to impact their customer experience as well. We know that their time is valuable, and we want to make sure that it's short, sweet, straight to the point, but also just, all, I would say, also is empathetic of what they dealt with or are dealing with um, and making sure that they understand that we also understand what they're going through um, and that we're going to do everything we can to make their lives easier ultimately. Um, and then last but not least, a strong incentive. incentive. It's something that um, we actually had a pretty in-depth discussion on as we were preparing for this. Um, and we are going to actually ask a follow-up question here in a few minutes on that specifically. Um, some of us have done incentives or coupons or discounts to get customers back. Um, some of us haven't. Some of us have done a combination, things along those lines. Um, so that's kind of something that we were going to go into. Um, with that said, um, we have another poll question. If you guys could just treat it as you did earlier. Do you agree with these five elements of an irresistible win back campaign? You should be able to click just on that slide there as you did on the previous slide. Okay, and beautiful. I was looking to get one more, and we got a few more. So this is uh, kind of what I expected, but there's some very interesting information in here. Um, obviously, a lot of us agree with most of those. It's pretty clear that I agree with a lot of them as well. Um, I, I would say I would say I would have probably entered agree myself. I wouldn't say strongly agree. 
Um, I'm interested to hear more uh, from those that stated they strongly disagree, um, as well as those that are neutral. And I'd be interested to hear what you guys um, believe might be uh, missing from that list that we discussed um, as well. Um, next, we're going to go into um, what some of those emails entail, what that process looks like, so on and so forth. Um, so first of all, obviously, that data collection is important. I would say data collection as well as your actual process. Um, that's something that we talked about earlier, knowing when they canceled, uh, why they canceled, what their NPS was historically. Were they um, were they scoring us at tens over service after service after service, and all of a sudden it was one bad experience that left a maybe two, and then all of a sudden they canceled. Does that impact how likely we're able to win them back? Yes, no, maybe. Is that something you would want to have a separate type of a campaign for? Um, things along those lines. Um, do you know the revenue impact and the opportunity? Um, like, for example, do you want to prioritize those that have a minimum of X dollars annual revenue? Uh, or do you want to treat all of those cancellations in the same, uh, in the same way? Um, and what kind of a call to action do you want to use? Um, Will actually shared a bunch of these from his inbox that he received himself, with the exception of the American Post one that I threw in there. Um, those were all some of the examples that Will had in his inbox from other companies, uh, other companies that he had received that he had canceled with um, that he thought would were great examples, and I totally agree. Um, you can see that obviously two of those there um, have a discount. Um, we have an example of a modern one there. Um, just asking if people are ready, uh, but they, oh, actually he does offer a discount as well by offering uh, to waive the initial fee to re resume the services. Um, and then I included a screenshot of our American one there that we just started again last month. We had done it previously with uh, a few years ago um, and had paused it, but since restarting, um, we, I, I tried to make it really personable. It's coming directly from our president um, it's a text-only campaign, and our response rates on that have been extremely impressive. Um, I would say probably around 40% responses to those emails, um, just giving us more information and more insight as to why they actually canceled, even though our SAVE team um, are going through the process of actually asking before he's having that follow-up thing, and then getting an email directly from the president is always pretty uh, makes you feel special a little bit, and it's been interesting to see that as well. Um, next, how are you going to deploy, deploy your WinBack campaign? So we talked about that um, earlier to see what all everybody had done. There was a lot of other in there. Um, I'm wondering if maybe some of those were SMS campaigns, anything along those lines. Of course, there's a phone call, email option, as we just discussed, direct mail option, so on and so forth. Um, obviously, Will and I both have a little bit more experience doing email campaigns specifically. Um, that's something that I think, at least from in my opinion, is easiest to implement, but also um, has a higher rate of return. It's not as uh, time consuming, um, but it's also fairly cheap to be able to um, create, implement, and maintain an email-specific uh, WinBack campaign, and that's kind of what I would imagine is why we've gravitated so much towards that. Um, Will, feel free to step in and correct me if you disagree, um, but direct mail can be very expensive, and then with phone calls, obviously, you have to worry about um, the staffing aspect of that as well. And then last but not least, the KPIs. What are the KPIs for your WinBack campaign? Once you launch, what are you expecting to see? Um, for example, obviously, I was uh, referring to response rates in the example I had with uh, the email from our president. Um, we have open rates, click rates, and call rates, um, as you can see, um, just as a base, baseline. Um, for American, we are currently this year seeing about a 40% open rate. Um, and this is for all emails, not just when back emails. Um, but 40% open rate, right around 0.5% click-through rate, 
0.3% unsubscribes, 0.1 bounce per is what we've kind of seen. I would say that's pretty similar to what we've seen historically. Um, one thing that I would say is important to that is making sure that you have a clean and uh, accurate email list because um, that will have a large impact on your numbers if that's not been cleaned in advance. Um, I think that covers all that I have. Uh, feel free to send questions over and then I have, oh, I do have one more question. And that is going back to the um, incentive question. So as you can see here, there's a couple of different types of incentives that um, other companies have offered. We mentioned that as one of the five elements of an irresistible campaign. Um, so next we want to ask if you guys have do or have offered a incentive in your win back campaign. And you'll answer that just as you mentioned, as we have before. All right. Yep, yeah, and this is very interesting. So um, we have, it's a pretty pretty good split. This is uh, kind of what I, I expected, I would say, a little bit. Um, it's something that, as I mentioned earlier, we discussed a lot as we were preparing for this. Um, it's something that um, I, I would say is, I, I, I think it could go either way. Um, I think that's something that Will's probably going to touch on here in a second as we go through building a campaign um, together and what that kind of entails. Um, but it is very interesting. So thank you all for those that have engaged. And Will, I'm going to pass it off to you. Thanks, Haley. So uh, I want to be cognizant of everyone's time. We only have a few minutes left, and we have gotten a bunch of great questions. So we're going to try to uh, go through these last two slides a little bit quickly. But um, there's a lot there's a lot in them. So you, we spent the last uh, 50 minutes or so really setting the the baseline of where we want to go, right? And, and I think what's critical for for me to leave this conversation with, and, and I'm going through it right now is what's the next step? Um, and this is a little look behind the curtain of, of where we are here at Modern as we build our strategy and when it comes to win back campaigns. And I really think this is important, and I apologize for the, the small wording on the bottom half, but this is what we've chosen to do. Um, we've looked at all the various methods to deploy a win back campaign. It's, you know, we've looked at phone calls, we've looked at direct mail campaigns, we've looked at everything, and we've determined that email is going to be our first uh, method of deployment. The reason we didn't choose phone calls is I heard from a, 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 a friend of mine who works for a different company, and they had uh, done a win back campaign, and they had won back 46 clients. I was like, wow, that's great, 46 clients, that's awesome. They had to make 3,500 phone calls to win back 46 clients. So their win back rate was about 1%. Now, if your organization has the capacity to do that, you know, if you have people who aren't answering the phones or they're not, or they're not as busy as they need to be and they can make some outbound calls to win back clients, great. You know, I, we would all love 46 additional clients uh, this month. But for some of us, that may not make sense. So that's, that's a decision you're going to have to make in your organization. When it comes to what we've chosen here at Modern is, like I said, to deploy that email campaign. And we really want to focus on the content and the messaging and everything that we talked about. Um, it's all about the timing. You know, if a client is, is canceling because they sold their home, let's think like consumers. It's probably 60 to 90 days before they're moving into something else. So we want to try to go after that client right about the time they're moving to the next home. Um, if a client is canceling because they don't have any need and they're can canceling in the middle of the winter, they're probably going to have some sort of pest issue happen. If you're up here in the Northeast, carpenter ant season is just about to hit or termite. Uh, we certainly can, you know, win them back when their pest pressure rises again. And, and it, this will be in the notes, but this is really the opportunity for you to build uh, a campaign that's using automation, right? So Modern is going to focus on four different types of clients, a client who's disloyal. This is on the left-hand side of the screen for those who can see my tiny font. Uh, the clients who are disloyal, clients who cancel because of high cost, Clients who cancel because of no need, 
and clients who cancel because they sold their home. And what we're going to do is deploy a content stream to really educate the client, but it's unique. You know, we, you don't want to go to the point where you just say to any client, uh, you left us, we want you back. All right, what's, what's the incentive for the client to want to be winned back? So this is really where uh, we're creating new, unique content streams based on the client journey of why they left us. Um, as you can see, we're going to be emailing these folks on various days, day one, day seven, day 14, day 21, day 45, to try to win them back to re-engage with our sales team. And we really want to focus on what's, what's the call to action. And in Haley's poll question, about 50% of us, you know, see the value of an incentive, but some don't. And that's okay. You know, everyone can offer some sort of incentive, but think like a consumer and understand what's going to cause me to engage. It is that catchy subject line, you know, that's important. That's as important as anything, because that's your opportunity to get into the front door. It's the opportunity to uh, create value with the client. It's something, and, and I always call it the cookie, something to give a cookie to a client, you know, to get them excited to want to pick up the phone or respond to that email. All right. And I apologize that we're tight for time, but as a marketing person, we always have to end with a whiteboard, right? Most marketing people love to have big giant whiteboards in their offices or wherever and scribble all over them. Um, unfortunately, I have the worst handwriting in the world, so I actually don't write on a whiteboard all that much. This is your opportunity and this is your takeaway. And, and certainly, you know, you'll see myself and Haley and Chad's email address um, later on. This is something we can collaborate with offline and I'm happy to, to work with anyone. I think it's just great. It's, it's an opportunity for me to learn more as well uh to build a win get back campaign if you were to sit down everyone on this call if you were to sit down this afternoon and go through these eight steps of how to win back a campaign you could have a win back campaign launch tomorrow it's uh certainly an opportunity for all of us you know it's going to be some hard work you're not going to win back i think one of the questions that we saw is you know what what is the win back percentage i honestly don't know it's going to vary by the the reason the client cancels the organization, how willing you are to give an incentive. If you said to your client, come back to us for free, uh, you'll never have to pay again. Your win back rate's probably going to be really high. You won't make any money, which isn't going to be a good thing, but you, you would win back a lot of clients. Um, so that's all things that we're going to have to think about as marketers and, and in our strategies on how to deploy the campaign. So with that being said, I'm going to hand it back to Mackenzie. Um, I know we have a few questions. We don't have a ton of time. So anything we don't get to in the session, I will make sure that myself or Haley or Chad follow up with. So thanks for um, sitting through this with us. And I really, really am excited that, uh, you know, as a takeaway that we get to collaborate in the future on how to build these campaigns better and better. Because like I said, you know, here at Modern and I know with American and Wayne we're all in this battle um, to win back clients. You know, for the, if it's not retention, it's win back. Okay, thank you all so much. That was great. At this time, we're going to jump into some questions we received during, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. <laughs> we received during registration and a couple we got during the presentation. Um, if you have any additional questions for our speakers, feel free to ask them at this time. Our first question, how can you best manage unhappy customers who post negative comments on social media? I, I, I'll I jump in with to... that one, Mackenzie. Yeah, I, and I'll just jump in that I'm a uh, consumer advocate, and this goes with my time in the industry. If a customer is going to take the time to put a negative review up on the Internet, most of the time it's justified. Um, either we've done something wrong and it's, it's a learning, it's a, an opportunity to learn uh, how to improve our overall customer experience. And it's really an opportunity for us to interact with the client. If, if they're going to take their valuable time and put something up on the internet, you know, shame on us if we ignore it. So, you know, I, I've always been the one and, and it comes right to me and I'm a busy person, but I see every review that comes into our, our, our organization and if it's a negative one, either myself, uh, you know, a, a manager or someone in the organization is, is going to try to reach out to that client as quickly as possible because they've taken the time to tell us we did a bad job. It's, it's up to us to try to fix that uh, experience for that client and then not have it happen again. 
Haley, I think you have a good comment there as well. <laughs> yeah, sure. I was I can totally hop on. Yeah. I mean, first of all, I would totally agree with everything that Will said. Um, I think it also um is common to not realize just how important those negative reviews also are to show that we're real and also show that we are willing to respond and make things right. That's something that we uh it's really important to me that we at American take advantage of those. Um, because that's an opportunity to one, educate other people that we do make mistakes. We're human too, you know. Um, I have a kind of a template uh, or rule book that I would say I kind of provided to my team um, that we kind of use as a guideline when responding to those reviews and how to handle that. Um, and of course, it's always try to uh, figure out what actually happened go into their account, look at their notes, talk to whoever they've uh, worked with, things along those lines. And then at the end of the day, you need to respond. Um, of course, we want to try to handle it outside of the public eye first, make things right um, via phone call, having a service technician go out, whatever that may be. In some instances, even having a manager go out. Um, and then once everything is settled, um, that's when we then revisit the public view aspect respond, making sure you're addressing what the problem was. Is it normal? Is it not? Was it a mistake? Was it something we need to change? Um, thanking them for giving them giving feedback, um, being empathetic, of course, um, and then just summarize what we're good, what you're going to do to make sure it doesn't happen again. I think that uh, is something that's commonly missed as well. Um, but it is something that I think is very important. I'd be happy to share that with any of those that uh, that template, if with any of those that would be interested, feel free to email me. Okay, our next question. Um, what is your opinion and experience on predictive analytics when it comes to client retention? That's a great question. I can, I can jump in and I'll just, from this is Chad, uh, I saw that question pop up and we, in my previous life and some of the other stuff I've done, we've used predictive analytics uh, all the way down to weather patterns and things like that. Uh, I'll speak to Wayne's. We it made me think we're we're not really doing that. Obviously, we're you know we know the numbers inside and out, but we're not looking we're not looking necessarily at predictive analytics in large degree um, as much as we are looking at where we are and using you know using previous data to to help drive some of those decisions. So uh, that that was actually an eye-opening question for me specifically. I don't know if if Haley or Will have any other any other thoughts there, but uh, I, I I was very appreciative of that question. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, there's no magic formula for winbacks. Again, it's it's really going to come back to a lot of different factors, you know, understanding the data in your system, you know, if, if you use pest pack or pest routes or whoever, you know, really understanding what type of client canceled, why they canceled, you know, really be more so than an analytics guru, be consider yourself an investigator and starting to understand, you know, pattern within the reason why clients cancel because of, let's say, high cost. Is it because you just did a price increase? Okay, well, that's a good investigation on how you may want to approach the client to educate them on the value of your service and why costs are going up. Um, Chad mentioned it earlier, you know, inflation's at 8%. All of our costs are going up. Um, it's, it's definitely a conversation on how do you pass that on to the consumer, but in a way that they don't cancel and understand why you're doing it. Okay, we have time for one more question. Um, what do you suggest doing when a customer doesn't communicate? Yeah, I, I saw that question. Great, great question, by the way. It's really hard, right? You know, you, you, you do all these wonderful campaigns and people just don't respond to you. Um, you know, I'll go back to my previous statement. Everything's in investigation and marketing. We're really, you know, it's, it's the psychological behavior of people is really what drives us as marketers. And we're always trying to find, you know, the, the ostrich with their head in the sand is a lot of how our, our is pretty common in how our consumers behave, right? They're not going to pop up and tell us 
why they canceled necessarily or why they hate us. You know, in many instances, they're just going to leave and disappear. It's it's up to us to really start to build that trend modeling and change the message, change the content, and try different things. And, and that that classic A B test of if I put this statement here instead of here, you know, in a in an email, or when I call a client, if I have my message verbiage that I leave behind say this versus that, you know, what's causing the client to reengage? Is it an incentive? then you know that you're down the incentive train. But that's a dangerous, you know, just offering people discounts and it is, isn't necessarily going to match uh, the value of the services that we provide. That's really what, what, what we have to investigate. And it's hard. I mean, it's, it's a time-consuming, uh, all-hands-on-deck type of approach, and, and I'm hands up. I don't have the magic answer to that. And I would love to add on to that, too, is we just uh, started testing something this week, actually, um, because as we after we implemented the saves process, it's obviously easier to save somebody when they've called in to cancel things along those lines. But something that we have experienced a lot of is customers just emailing and saying, cancel my service. Um, and at that point, it is usually that much harder to get those customers on the phone because they didn't want to call us in the first place. Um, so something that we just implemented was a form that um, I would say asked not only the uh, obvious question as to why they're canceling, but also ask the follow-up questions to kind of get into the root cause um, instead of them just saying, um, I, I'm not pleased with your service, getting into the details, like was it the customer service team, um, was it the service that they received in the field, um, things along those lines. Um, we just started it, uh, I think, actually Monday, and we've already received uh, over 10 responses from those. Um, so I'm really excited to see that continue, and I'd be happy to share a uh, copy of some of those questions for any of those that ask. Great. All right. Thank you all so much for attending today's webinar, New Season, New Cancels, Ways to Win Back Turn Customers. Brought to you by PMP Magazine and our sponsor of the event, Slingshot. If you have any additional questions for myself or for our speakers, you can reach out to us directly via the email addresses you see on this current slide. A recording of this webinar will be emailed to you tomorrow and posted to our site. Upcoming webinars from PMP will also be posted to that page. Thank you all for attending, and we hope you'll join us for another great webinar.